Good afternoon folks, welcome back to Higher Chemistry. Um, we're moving on to our uh, next big section really. So far we've done a section on rates, enthalpy and energy. We did a section on uh, patterns in the periodic table, apparently randomly, but it's not random at all because those patterns are going to influence the way the atoms bond together. Um, and we are very shortly going to come on to, uh, in fact today, sorry I'm rambling, we're going to come on to our next section, section 3, which is bonding in elements, and then in section 4, bonding in compounds, you'll find out why all those patterns were important. Um, let's stick to elements just now, because they're nice and simple. Um, we are, uh, this unfortunately, this isn't done the same way in the scholar document, they do things a completely different way, um, we do it our way, to quote Frank, because I think it's better and easier to understand. So we're going to jump into bonding in the elements. Uh, there are four types of bonding in elements. Um, I think we'll maybe cover two today. One is revision from National 5, uh, which is great news to hear. The other one is uh, new, to, new to hire. So if I was to put a key down the side, I'm going to refer back to this page through the next few videos or so. Let's put a key down the side and what we'll do is we'll start with type um, we'll start with uh, metallic bonding because metallic bonding if you cast your minds back to National 5 I'll run through it very quickly just a couple of minutes worth. Metallic bonding applies to most of the periodic table so I'm going to take the brave move of just leaving it blank to save me colouring most of the table in. Um, a metallic bond uh, was was an unusual one actually. If we take an atom, for example, of aluminium, aluminium has got thirteen protons. That's its atomic number. So therefore, an atom, of course, has thirteen electrons as well. These electrons are arranged two, eight, three, and the thirteen protons are in here. I know. Don't shout at me. I've missed out the neutrons, but they're not really relevant to us at the moment. Um, now, as you can see, uh, the rule uh, that we learned way back in third year that the outer electron level has to be full up does not apply at the moment. So therefore, this is an unstable atom. It's not happy. And it's doubly not happy because there's nothing else around except other aluminium atoms because we're dealing with elements. Remember here? So 2, 8, 3, there's another aluminium atom. And lastly down here, we'll do another aluminium atom. 2, 8, how can these atoms make themselves stable? There is nowhere for these three electrons to be transferred to. This is not a compound. So what does the aluminium atom do? Fascinatingly, it decides just to throw off these three electrons anyway. They sling their hook. Where do they go? Well, they are left to wander aimlessly through the block of metal. So if we redraw our aluminium down here, a more stable version of our aluminium. Um, it's got uh, still 13 protons and 2 and then 8 next door to it. The other atom, 13 protons, 2 and 8. And the last atom, only well, we can't use that term anymore, can we? The last thing, last particle of aluminium is here. This is a very, very small block of aluminium. <laughs> it's only three atoms big, but that's okay. Nanoparticles of aluminium. Now, our electrons that we kicked off, there are nine electrons just left wandering in amongst this. Feel free to pause the video and rack through your brains for the term to describe these electrons, and then you can unpause it and join us again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They are delocalized electrons, of course and they're no longer assigned to one particular uh, atom of aluminium, and these aren't atoms anyway, because we've got 13 protons, and we only have 10 electrons, so technically speaking, these are big positive ions. Um, so this is a big plus charge. This, plus three charge actually, this is a big plus charge, and these electrons move around and stick these big positive charges together, hence the slightly trite textbook phrase, which are ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. That's metallic bonding for you. It does all these cool things, doesn't it? The metals do so well. You can push extra electrons in. 
So if we fire an extra electron in here, it goes dum 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 and fires another one out the end, quite happily like a domino chain. And that, of course, is why they conduct electricity so well. Another really funky thing is that this sea of electrons exists at the very surface of the metal. And when light comes in, it bounces off the sea of electrons, and that's why metals are reflective and non-metals are not. You can get a lovely crystal of sulfur or iodine, but it doesn't look anything like a metal. Delocalized electrons are responsible for that wonderful shine on the silver atoms in my ring here. That's probably all I want to say about metals, to be honest, because that's old news. Let's go to type 2. Uh, type 2 is that is metallic bonding, by the way. Uh, type 2 are going to be called the monatomic gases. Now, in other words, mon means one. So we're talking about gases which go about as single atoms. Now, there is only one area on the periodic table where that happens, where they are happy by themselves. They do not have to form any other bonds with anything. Um, and I'm hoping that you're shouting at me from the audience that that's going to be group eight then, or group zero. You have to remember I'm very old, I'm afraid. So I tend to call it group eight. The modern nomenclature is group zero. Um, so I think monatomic gases we will shade in on the blue diagonal here. And they appear here. So um, that's what we're dealing with this structure. If I were to bring in my incredibly high-tech model of a monatomic gas, excuse me just two seconds. Fortunately, I acquired, I didn't acquire some other mods, I brought some other mods home to help with my son before the shutdown occurred. So we've got some kicking about in the, in the house. And this is a model of a monatomic gas. As you go, oh, it's lost one of the atoms, there we go. Um, and as you can see, they're just individual atoms wandering around, as gases do, of course, not connected with each other in any way. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the temperature. Let's turn the temperature down on my freezer. My freezer's currently sitting at minus 15. But if I had a super freezer, I might be able to turn it down to, say, minus a couple of hundred. And at this point, the atoms of the gas will now do this. They are staying together. Now, there must be a reason for them staying together. There's something that we haven't mentioned up until now. In fact, if we turn the temperature down even further, the atoms of the gas now do this. They still vibrate on the spot, by the way. It's just a little bit tricky to show that. So the atoms are still vibrating, but they have formed a solid. Now, that means there must be something sticking each of these atoms to its neighbour. The question is, what is that? I can tell you what it's not. It's not covalent bonds. It's not ionic bonds. These guys already have a full outer layer. They don't want to form any bonds at all. So here's the question for today. What is it that sticks the monatomic gases, that's the noble gases, to each other? It's a brand new concept. We're going to call them London Dispersion Forces because that's their name. So in the next five minutes, I'm going to hopefully describe what causes them and what affects the strength of these London dispersion forces. Um, cause, first of all, well, let's draw ourselves an atom of helium. Uh, stick the second simplest element in the universe. Two positives in the centre and a layer of two negatives on the outside. Now, we always draw it like this. In reality, these electrons are not stationary. They actually float around randomly around this atom, which means they're constantly on the move. Now, if we could freeze them from time to time, you'll get different distributions. Just for random reasons, you might find this electron. Let's take that electron from there. And let's pop it there, for example. We can move these electrons around anywhere you like. And every so often, you're going to come across a situation where this happens. Just by random distribution, we have an uneven distribution of electrons. Now, so what? Well, that means that at this end of the atom, you've got no negative charges. And all your negative charges are here. 
Effectively, we've turned this single atom of helium into tiny little, like a bar magnet, with a very slightly positive charge at one end and a very slightly negative charge at the other. This is what's called a dipole. So a dipole is just something we stole from physics. It's got a positive end and a negative end. A bit like a magnet. It's very, very small though, so the SQA want you to be familiar with this symbol here. This is a lowercase delta instead of the triangle for the uppercase, which indicates a large difference. This just means a tiny difference. So there is a tiny difference in this atom. What effect will that have? Well, apparently nothing, except of course, it's going to have an effect on this neighbouring atom here. Because you've got a positive charge here, I, that means you're going to attract the electrons over to the end of this atom here. So now we've created ourselves another small dipole. Delta plus, delta minus. And now we see, hopefully, where London dispersion forces form. There is a very, very slight force of attraction between these two atoms, between their dipoles, the positive end of one and the negative end of the other. Those are London dispersion forces, which I'm just going to shorten to LDFs, because life's too short. So this is what causes London dispersion forces. It's an uneven distribution of electrons, but there's a key word missing here. The SQA love you to know on the right, because it is only temporary. I did say that these electrons are constantly on the move like a cloud of flies. So this is here for a fraction of a second, and then it's gone again. So they make and break. What do you reckon that, that means about the strength of these forces then? Because they are very small and because they're only temporary, these forces are feeble. And as a result of that, uh, they are very, very easily broken. Um, I'm just going to do something that I should have done before. Sorry, I'm going to look up the boiling point of helium. I think it's about minus 270, but I'll just check. Boiling point of helium... Uh... I'll just pause this, sorry. Wikipedia is being awkward. Minus 269 Celsius, there's only one off. Um, that is how little energy you have to give in order to boil helium. And I said my second point would be what controls the strength of these London dispersion forces. Well, now we're going to skip away from helium and we're going to go to xenon. Um, actually, let's go with uh, neon in fact. Let's go with neon because it's easier to draw. So here's a neon atom. It's going to have 10 protons in the centre and 2 and 8 electrons here. Now we now have 10 electrons instead of 2 electrons. And if these 10 electrons randomly happen to be just all at one end, then you can hopefully see... So 2 electrons here and 8 electrons here. I'm hoping that you can see, guys, that this dipole we've made is going to be delta positive, delta negative. But because you've got 10 electrons at one end, this delta is going to be larger than it was for helium. Now, what I'm saying here is basically the larger number of electrons there is per atom, the larger this delta can be and the stronger the LDFs will be. Now, if that holds correct, if that statement I've just made is correct, that means that as you go down group 8, the London dispersion forces should become a lot stronger and therefore the boiling points should rise and in fact that is precisely what you see because if you plot boiling point against atomic number you get a line that's more or less like that so as the atomic number increases the boiling point increases as well that's all I want to say in this video I'm going to go on in the next video to look at the next type of structure here because We've covered metallic and monatomic gases. We've discovered that monatomic gases are held to their neighbours by something, something new we didn't know about, something called London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces are caused by randomly uneven distribution of electrons. This forms a slight positive and slight negative. That's a dipole. It's only temporary, though, because the dipoles come and go. And also, this means that the forces are very weak. And the last thing we covered is the more electrons you have per atom, the stronger the London dispersion forces are, and this raises the boiling point. You have to put a little bit more energy into it to boil it. Thanks for listening.